Welcome, welcome, welcome. OC Singles for Christ, our church family that has just joined us online. And we've got a couple folks in here tonight, just our production team and a couple of good friends. We are so excited to worship with you. We're just going to give folks just a few minutes to tune in and log on. So hang tight and uh, get your worship shoes on or kick your worship shoes off so you can be on holy ground, whatever you like. We'll be starting in just a couple moments. Once again, if you're just tuning in, welcome. We are so glad that you have joined us tonight for our Friday evening OC Singles for Christ service, our live service online, and welcome our couples. It's for everyone, singles, couples, married couples, dating couples. We are so glad that you guys are here, just giving folks just a minute or two to log on and join us. We'll be starting shortly.
we are getting ready to kick off worship tonight. Just waiting for a thumbs up from our production team. Are we good to go? Once again, welcome, welcome all of our friends and family here with OC Singles for Christ. We are so glad that you have joined us tonight. It is Friday night. Guess what? It's my birthday. Woohoo! Yay! I cannot think of a better place to be than with family, with church friends and family, worshiping our awesome God tonight. So won't you join us? I just want to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in. And just a reminder as we kick off, uh, this is your time. This is your time with the Lord. So you guys can do whatever you want. You can dance around. You can do cartwheels. You can do some somersaults. You can be on your knees, on your face, whatever you like to do. This is your time with Jesus. And I know he loves our worship in all forms. He is glorified when we just give him everything, give him our heart. My name is Jessica, by the way. You see my name up on the screen, of course. Everyone say hi, Jessica. Hello, hello. And uh, please welcome my team. We've got Shane on my left and Conrad on my right. Yes, my awesome team. We are excited to worship. So let's kick off. How many of us are thankful for God's amazing grace? Amen. All right, you guys can feel free to stand, whatever you want to do, just your time. Here we go. Worthy is the 
Jesus tonight. I don't know about you. I don't know where I would be without my Savior, without my best friend. And Lord, we just want to honor you tonight in this place. Holy Spirit, come. Touch every heart. Touch every heart that is watching. Wherever they are, God, just fill their space with your love with your grace, with your mercy. Lord, for all that you have done, we just desire to pour out our love for you are worthy tonight. All of our heart and our affections go to you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. have passed away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the cornerstone things that we thought were dead you done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one that our hearts adore
as our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. We love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the just feel like there are people that need to hand over the cares, the burdens that are on their shoulder right now, wherever you are. The Lord is with you. He is before you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Hand your burdens over to him right now. Place them in his capable hands. These burdens were not for you to carry. These anxieties, these fears, these worries about the future, the worries about the virus, the worries about things opening. And what does that mean, Lord? Cover them head to toe. Be glorified in our lives, Lord. I just pray for protection over every soul. I pray for healing over every soul. You know every single person by name. And you've known them since before they were formed in their mother's belly. And you have good plans in store for your kids. Tonight as we continue in worship, we want to sing a blessing over you tonight. This is straight from scripture. It's my new favorite song. I've been blasting it since lost since lockdown. And it's directly out of numbers. I just want to bless you with this tonight. We just want to have an outpouring of God's truth over your lives tonight. So as we worship, just in a posture of receiving this blessing tonight. You can hold open your hands. Put your hands in the air, be on your knees, 
lay down whatever it is, but soak in this truth. Children and their children, may His presence. 
Lord is for you tonight. He is not against you. He has only good gifts for his kids. Would you just receive everything that heaven has to offer tonight? So many gifts that he has for his kids. So much more than what we have settled for. We have settled for pain. We have settled for fear. We have settled for worries. We have settled for poverty. We have settled for the unknown that cripples us and paralyzes us. But the Lord Jesus tonight says, no more. He has so much for you. Receive his blessing tonight. Receive his sanctification tonight. Receive his cleansing tonight. Let him wash over you with the blood of Jesus that he so graciously gave for every single one of us. Let him refresh your soul. Let him remind you tonight of who you are in him. You are a child of the king. The moment you place your trust in Jesus, he says, you are mine forever there is no more separation thank you God thank you God that you go before us you walk alongside of us you are with us and you are for us we love you Father we thank you we thank you for your mighty love that changes everything we ask this in the beautiful, matchless, powerful, gracious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you guys. <sighs> Whew. Yeah, we can give the Lord some praise tonight, all five of us in here, or six, seven. We are so grateful that you have joined us tonight and thank you for a few of you guys being here tonight. We just want to welcome you once again and say that if you have tuned in, please know that you are part of our family. It doesn't matter where you're tuning in from. It could be Timbuktu. We don't care. We are so thankful that you have joined us tonight. So welcome, welcome once again to OC Singles for Christ. And as we continue in this time of worship, we're going to go ahead and take up our offering. This is just another form of worship. And the Lord is very clear that he loves a cheerful giver. And I just want to encourage you tonight just not to give out of compulsion or not to give simply because you're supposed to or the leftovers, but let's give out of the abundance of our heart. Not because this ministry needs your money, even though, of course, we need the money to keep the lights on and keep this program going, of course, but God does not need your money, but he needs your open heart. Because with an open heart, we can also receive. It's the same pipe. If we close off the pipe, we can't receive either. So I just want to encourage you to open up your hearts tonight and just pray about whatever the Lord would have you to give, just to sow into kingdom work tonight. We've been reaching about 5,000 people a week, and we are so excited to be able to connect as God's family in that way. And we want to thank you for your partnership because it's you guys that are keeping this going and we're excited when we can all gather again so we're going to pray for our offering but just a reminder a couple of ways that you can give um, we've got the slide up of course you can always go online to our website there is a giving button super super easy just follow the instructions you can use the zelle app or through your bank most banks use zelle and you can just send it to a person and you can use the oc singles for christ it's thomas rose's um, email address and it goes directly into our church account super super easy and of course you can always go to smile.amazon.com it's the exact same website as amazon and you can select oc singles for christ to be your designated um, gift of where the money goes and amazon gives us free money which is amazing so lots of different ways and a good old-fashioned way is send in a check I'm a check person, so if we have that address, go ahead and put the address up there. Easiest as pie is to simply write a check, and I think there's something satisfying about signing a check and saying, yes, Lord, continue kingdom work. 
But thank you for your partnership. Thank you for sowing into this ministry. We love you, and let's pray. Father, we are so grateful, so grateful for all that you have given us. Just like the songs we sang, we are thankful for your amazing grace that you set us free. We are thankful for family, that we even have a place that we can gather whether it's online or in chairs or in a building or outside when we run into each other. Your love just permeates, and we are so thankful for that. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, and we ask, God, that you would lead and guide with these funds, with these finances, lead and guide the the person giving, and lead and guide this church to use it for your glory, to multiply souls for your kingdom. Bless it now and bless the giver in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And I just want to say once again, thank you for those of you that have been continuing to give faithfully. You have no idea what a beautiful thing that is. And we literally couldn't do this ministry without you. So thank you for that. God bless you. And let's welcome Pastor Thomas to hear an encouraging message tonight. All right. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate that. And uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Orange County Singles for Christ and for couples as well. And to all of you on Facebook, glad that you're there. If you happen to be uh, sitting at home, you want to tell a friend about uh, our broadcast that's going on live, just uh, uh, send them this link. And uh, as Jessica just mentioned, uh, 5,000 people are checking us out every week. It's amazing. On Friday nights, there's maybe, when I get home, the number's somewhere around six to 700 people. Then by the next Thursday, it's up to 5,000 as people continue to see uh, the broadcast throughout the week. And that's pretty awesome with this technology that we have and uh, grateful for it. It has been a, uh, a lifeline for the last nine weeks as we've been living in seclusion for one another. But that is just uh, the way uh, things have been going and most churches have gone to online services and uh, we are no different and uh, it's amazing to see the footprint that God has allowed us to establish for people all over the country that are watching this broadcast. It's really, really cool. And uh, every Friday night we're actually here uh, with our live broadcast for years and we're also here as well on Friday nights. Now, obviously the last uh, nine weeks there's nobody here, but I got some good news. Things are going to be changing. Uh, starting next week, which leads us to a couple of announcements that I have before you before we get into our message tonight, is people have been asking, sending emails today with tons of texts, hey, when are you opening up? And yes, that's the $64,000 question. Thankfully, our President of the United States and our Department of Justice and our Attorney General, Bill uh, William Barr, have answered that question. We are open now. And so uh, people have kind of come this evening that uh, they're welcome, not going to turn anybody away, but our official reopening will be next Friday night, and uh, this is what I do need for you to do, because when we open up next Friday night, the building right now is under construction in the front part of the building, and so the way we do uh, our uh, live service, meaning people being here, it's going to change a little bit, and also with the the, uh, guidelines for how we opening up, we'll know more on Monday as the state of California Uh, gives us uh, the guidelines that they would like for us to adhere to. And obviously we will until we get to phase four of the reopening of California. At that point, it's back to normal. But what I do need for you to do is this. If you wouldn't mind here, I'm going to put this uh, on the screen, is our um, website, and uh, actually for our newsletter. Down at the bottom here, this is our newsletter. And uh, we can go back one slide. That would be great. And down at the bottom is our website. Uh, There we go. Let's stay with that one with the, uh, uh, there we go. At the bottom here. This guy right there. That is our website. And next Wednesday evening, actually in the afternoon, I'll be sending out an email broadcast to probably around 8,000 or 9,000 people. And if you're not on the newsletter, now's the time to jump on. So if you go to the website, uh, ocsinglesforchrist.org, Look at the top of the screen, you will see a button that says newsletter, and please sign up because that will tell you uh, when I send out the broadcast on Wednesday, it'll have all the directions. 
and I'm assuming we'll probably have to be six feet apart, so we'll have, we may be indoors, we may be outdoors, we may be a combination of both. Uh, I'll know more, and I'll let you know on Wednesday. So that's pretty cool. So welcome back. I'll see most of you again next Friday night. And again, feel free to come. And if you don't want to come, just uh, out of a sense of wanting things to, to uh, time for pass, that's just fine either way. But I hope you do come. It would be great to see everybody's faces again. <laughs> again. Now, uh, the second uh, uh, announcement is that we are beginning our um, events again. And our first event uh, is tomorrow. It's a hike being led by uh, Jack Miller. And on the screen right here, you'll see his phone number. I'm not quite sure if you could see that. However, if you go to the website under the wow button, or if you go on uh, Meetup, or if you go on Facebook, that information is all there. They're going to meet up at Newport Coast, the hiking trails that are at Coastal Peak Park. And when you go up the hill, I think it's Ridge Route. At the top of Ridge Route, there's a cul-de-sac. That's the beginning of the trails. That's where you want to meet at 9 o'clock sharp. Bring a bottle of water. I am assuming it's going to be a warm day, so wear a hat. It's a rather easy uh, hike. I understand they're going to be doing the ridge line. I'm be giving a yes on that one. You'll be hiking the ridge line, which is a little bit of an easier hike. And then when you're done, we're going to go down to, uh, and have lunch at Sharky's, do some takeout, and then find a place to sit and have lunch together. Somewhere around 30 to 40 people have already signed up. So uh, it doesn't matter. The trails are open. They do ask for social distancing. So we'll just go out in twos and separate each other and then just go have fun. So, and with the uh, events that are now uh, starting back up here, I want to throw uh, Liz Mickelson's address. This is uh, Liz Mickelson. She uh, uh, runs our events team. And if you'd like to be a part of our events team, I would like to encourage you to uh, email her and, and uh, let her know that you'd like to join that team. We're going to be um, meeting very shortly, uh, probably next week, as far as setting up some events for um, June and July. Now, this is Memorial Day weekend. We normally have our picnic on Monday, on Memorial Day. Unfortunately, because of all that's been taking place, uh, we will not be hosting that. So uh, enjoy your Monday wherever you're going to be with family and friends. But we will start back up our picnics uh, on July 4th. So it'll be same as usual, and uh, we'll get that information out. Uh, that's just one event coming up in July and a bunch of other things. Most of the events will be outdoors for the first couple of months until things get back to a, a sense of normality. So uh, with that said, I do want to thank the uh, what I call heroes in the church. Now, they're also called the production team. And I have some slides here that I'd like to show you that uh, I've done from time to time and to kind of show you in just a moment who our production team is. They have been meeting faithfully these last uh, uh, nine weeks. Uh, sometimes there's only been us eight. Tonight there's a lot more than eight, which is just great. But uh, this is our production team, uh, Ruben, uh, who Ruben's on the far side, uh, is uh, running the sound and lighting. And uh, Ron Green, who's right here, he is a part of staging. And underneath him is Dodi Urbanski, who is our accountant, who takes care of all the checks and pays the bills and keeps us financially sound. And uh, to her, across from her, is Daniel Boone LaFay. Daniel does a great job with our website and all the changes that have been taking place. And there's more to come. I don't want to bore you with the details tonight as I want to get into our message tonight. But underneath that is Yamo. Yamo uh, does all the stage design, as you can see. Are we able to bring the camera out and so people can, are we able to widescreen the camera? Is that possible? While I'm talking here, so you can kind of get a sense of the stage. There are three of these slat walls, there you go, that uh, are all lined up. And that's the stage that we're meet on. So the band is on one side, I'm on the other side. Yamo does all of that. And then Scott Jensen is in the back, who is running the computers that you see here. And also my, uh, uh, I have a teleprompter here as well. And uh, we all get here early in the afternoon to set up, and uh, away we go. So I want to thank them for being the production team or the heroes in the church. And there's other people who have been coming as well to help out, uh, Griff Corzarin and a few others that have been here. Griff's waving over there in the background. But just wanted to thank you. Then our uh, worship team, I think the next slide before this one, hopefully there's Jessica 
and there's Conrad, and, then, and there's Shane as well. The band changes from week to week, but Jessica is here uh, three out of four Fridays. I got a lot of texts last week. Where's Jessica? Because we had Joel, and Joel and Jessica kind of switch off, and uh, that's why a lot of you didn't see Jessica last week. So, And uh, I'll tell you a little secret about Jessica at the end of the broadcast. But uh, everybody that's here is here because they want to be here. They want to be here to bring a sense of normality in the, in, a, in the midst of what I have seen is a lot of fake news, a lot of uh, print and media just installing fear in people's lives. And it's our desire to uh, bring a program that's got great worship, relevant Bible teaching, that is able to bring a sense of normalness in the midst of craziness of our environment in which we live in. And they all love you. No one's here by coercion or force. We're simply here because we love you and we want to be an encouragement to you. Every week I say this because it is unquestionably true. We need to keep our hearts focused on Jesus Christ. He is the foremost thing in yours and my life as Christians. And as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior for our lives but for all mankind, we need to keep our concentration on him. He alone is the one who sustains us, guides us, protects us, and in due course will see us to our ultimate destination, which is home, heaven. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is more controlling or more skilled than Jesus Christ. It is through him that all things are formed, all things consist, all things exist for him, and shortly, very soon, in that fearful day that's called the judgment seat, People from all millennia will stand before the throne in which Jesus will be seated on. And the Bible says that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And uh, tonight I would just want to encourage those who refuse to consider Jesus, the claims of Jesus Christ. Beware. Accountability is coming. Our job as Christians, we're not perfect but we know the perfect one. We're not people who save people. God, through Jesus Christ, is the one who saves people. And right now, in this time frame, don't delay. Consider the claims of Jesus Christ and, and who he said he was as the Savior and Lord of this world. There's so much written about him, you cannot, with an open mind, come away with anything other than this guy must who, be who he said he was, and he said he was God in the flesh. Because in this time in which we have to freely accept God's forgiveness and to have him come into our lives to be our Savior and Lord, this time is going to end. And then comes a period of time called the tribulation period of seven years of hell on earth. You think the coronavirus has been rough? Ha! It's a walk on the park compared to the seven years that are coming upon the planet that are revealed to us in the book of Revelation called the seven-year tribulation. You don't want to be here for that. Trust me. So why not switch your eternal destination now by considering Jesus Christ and his claims for your life and the forgiveness that he offers to you? Tonight I want to answer the question, is anybody listening? Is anybody listening to our life's message? And I think that's an important question to answer because it affects our life's trajectory and our effectualness depends on getting this question right. Would you join me in prayer? And then let's get into the message. Father in heaven, we thank you for these brief moments to uh, spend time in your word. Thank you for Jessica and the band as they brought us to worship. Now, Father, I ask and pray that you'd use this time as we get into your word to change our lives, to bring us hope, to bring us encouragement, to give us a sense of your purposes for our lives as we get into the word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The story is told of uh, President uh, uh, Roosevelt, Franklin uh, Roosevelt, who often endured long lines in, in receiving lines as people came to the White House. And uh, one of the things he really liked cause, uh, did not like is he felt that people were not listening to him. And it was just sort of like a, a long line of, hi, how are you? And he would ask questions. And it would... And, it seemed like nobody was, was listening to him. And so one day in this receiving line, a special occasion at the White House, he decided to run a trick. 
And what he said to everyone who came and shook his hand was this. I murdered my grandmother this morning. I, mur I murdered my grandmother. How are you, sir? Oh, by the way, I murdered my grandmother this morning. The funny thing is, and he said this to everybody in line, and they all came back with, good to see you, sir. God bless you. You're doing a great job. Marvelous job you're doing. Nobody was listening to him <laughs> except the last guy in line who happened to be the ambassador to, to the country of Bolivia. And the president said, you know what? This morning I murdered my grandmother. The ambassador kind of looked and leaned over and said very discreetly, well, she must have deserved it, sir. Somebody was listening, but most people don't. Is anybody listening to us? Does anybody care about the true message of Jesus Christ in his life, death, burial, and resurrection? Do people take notice of the truth is right before their eyes? I read countless uh, postings on Facebook. There's pictures of Jesus, and Jesus does this, and Jesus does that, and I see uh, postings of scripture verses behind beautiful scenery and, and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I look for, and I love them all, by the way, is I look to see if anybody's responded. And I find that most of the time, people have not responded with the emojis that you can respond with, like a thumbs up or a, a heart or whatever, or your know, smiley face or whatever. A lot of them are just passed by. And I find that rather to be rather interesting that the truth can be retold countless times, and yet are people paying attention? Our world is in chaos like never before. You've got nation states like China and Russia and Iran who are just putting out all sorts of false information on the Internet, and people are just sucking it up, along with the media and all that kind of stuff. And people are, attention, are paying attention to nonsense on social media, even though the true truth is right in front of them. Many people are sleeping even while they're awake. Jesus said this about... Um, end time uh, conditions about the hu of humanity at that time when he comes back. And he says this in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37, 38, and 39. We're going to put it up on the screen for you. Oh, there it is. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah, which ought to tell you right there that the story of Noah was a true story because Jesus is referring to it, and Jesus would never tell a lie. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Santa. So will it be when the Son of Man comes. Interesting. Jesus is using the illustration of Noah and what was taking place in Noah's day but what it'll look like when Jesus comes back. People will just be going on, enjoying life, and all that kind of stuff. But also there are other conditions as well that are true about Noah. About Noah. So what about this time frame uh, in human history that Jesus refers to? What was humanity like? What were they up to? Did they know God? Did they believe in God? Who is this Noah that Jesus sets apart and would reference him? How many people were alive during the day, days of Moses? All of those questions are really uh, interesting and intriguing questions, and the Bible answers many of those. One of the fun ones to discuss is the population of the earth at the time of Noah. Now, the Bible explains that people were extremely corrupt and violent prior to the flood, along with what Jesus described as just going about their business and giving in marriage and partying and all that kind of good stuff. But it's not hard to understand that Noah's world was filled with wars and disease and other factors that would keep the population in check. Others believe that the Earth's population was much higher. And if you were to consider a growth factor of like what we had in the year 2000, which was 0.012%, there would be, that translates into somewhere around 700, 750 million people on the Earth at the time of Noah. And if you just change that statistic 
to 0.001, just one one thousandth of a percent, you'd have about four billion people on the earth in the time of Moses, or excuse me, time of Noah. Who knows? Interesting conjecture, but there were people that were here. The book of Genesis gives us four chapters, for chapters 6 through 10, are given to li- the life and the story of Moses, or Noah. And our physical existence today flows out of this storyline. So let's look at Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 7, and then we'll continue on. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. And nevertheless, his days shall be 125 years. Interesting. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. They were also called giants. <coughs> and, after, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them, and they were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. They were big people. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that the intent, get this, and the intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. The Lord was sorry, some translations say the Lord was grieved or repented that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart, and the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I've made them. What a commentary on this time frame in the life of Noah. People were given in marriage, drinking, whatever, but violence reigned upon the earth. The intents of everyone's heart was evil. Amazing commentary that God tells us about. The human condition of the society of Noah's day was totally corrupt. The reference to the sons of God, some people postulate that the sons of God is a reference to fallen angels who had sex with uh, human females, and that produced a super race of humans called the Nephilim or the giants. And they were corrupt as well. The people of that day were clueless as to what God was about to do, even though one man brought a different message for 125 years. Verse 8 tells us that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It's in verse 8, which is rather interesting. How did Noah find favor with the Lord out of an entire race of humanity that was corrupt and violent and every thought of their heart was evil? How does one guy escape all that? Think of the pressure underneath uh, uh, Noah and what he was experiencing for his lifetime. Amazing to think about. But you know, it's interesting, through Adam and Eve, humans obtained the knowledge of good and evil. However, it was not beneficial uh, for them. They were far better off if they would have just trusted God in the Garden of Eden. The grief and the pain of human sin was not something that people also felt, but God himself grieved over it, and God pronounced judgment over every living creature. Life would end in 125 years, and God would wipe out the birds, the animals, the creeping things, and humanity. Anything that had the breath of life would be killed, which is rather sad because what did an animal ever do? What did a bird ever do? What did a lizard ever do to justify being killed? Because God, in planning for judgment, would indeed take the breath away from all living creatures. Except for, which is rather interesting, the creatures of the sea. Did you ever give thought to that? God did not kill the creatures of the sea. Fish, the Leviathan, sea monsters, which we know as whales, sharks, whatever was in the sea at that time. God did not kill, which is interesting. Verse 8, and sadly, what's rather interesting about the condition of of people's hearts is that things haven't changed a whole lot 
the human heart and what fills it, sadly, is the same condition today as it was back then. And yet verse 8 tells us one guy finds favor with the Lord. Noah found favor with the Lord. And we're not told in verse 8 why, but we are told in the following verses of verse 9 to 12, where Moses tells us in Genesis 6, 9 to 12, these are the uh, records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and he walked with God. Three things right there. Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. The Lord looked out on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all fresh flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. But there was one guy that wasn't corrupt. How did he do it? How did one guy, amidst all the pressure of upwards of maybe 4 billion people walking in absolute depravity, one guy finds favor with God? God tells us. God says that Noah was a righteous guy. He wasn't sinless, but his walk with God was righteous or right, decent, morally right. Noah was a moral man living in a time of absolute immorality. He was blameless. In what sense was he blameless? Now, he certainly wasn't blameless according to our vernacular of today, which means to be without sin, but he, Noah lived a wholesome life. He, was, he lived a life that he had sinned. The scripture records the fact that he got drunk and exposed himself after the flood. Which is why Noah and the rest of us have to find grace with God to have favor with him. And then finally, Noah walked with God. Noah communed with God. His life was characterized by a conscious desire to please God in the spite of his human weakness. You'll see that saved set of David as well. He was a man after God's own heart. And yet he committed adultery. He had killed people. He had killed people. Uh, he murdered people. Uh, his life was full of all sorts of stuff. But it was his heart that God looked at. He had a heart after God. Noah had a heart for God. And he walked with God in the midst of all of his weaknesses. The flood begins with a description of Noah being righteous. It, ste- it seems to... Uh, be that the main purpose of the story is not to show why God sent the flood, but rather why God saved Noah. Noah's righteousness is contrasted with the violence in, of all flesh. The, mesh, the message couldn't be any more clear. God saved Noah because he walked with God and didn't corrupt God's ways. The picture of Noah emerges, becomes a model of the kind of light that finds grace in the sight of God. What is it? simple obedience and walking with him. As compared to everyone that existed at that time, Adam and Eve could have chosen uh, to live rightly or wrongly. And the people of Noah's day could have chosen to live rightly or wrongly, and they chose to live wrongly. And uh, which is rather sad. They had a choice. All had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All walked in depravity of the darkness of their hearts, even though they could choose rightly. The human heart naturally gravitates towards evil and wrong living. The prophet Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else. It's desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Humanity has a heart problem. It's a heart that's given over to evil and corruption unless there's a like movement of the grace of God in the person's life and God begins to work in their life so they learn what it means to walk blameless and righteous and to be able to walk with God. Since it's a sad condition that humanity lived in then and humanity lives in today, it is a spiritual corrupt heart that is incurable aside for the grace of God in our lives. Even today, Even though it seems like our world is walking in sin and decay, the truth is people could and should live rightly, but they don't. People are living spiritually dead to God, living in sin and incapable of of doing spiritual good. The Apostle Paul gives us a picture of, along with Jesus, but Paul gets a little bit more specific in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7, 
where he gives us a sense of what life will be like uh, when Jesus comes back. Now see if any of these things ring true for us in our world today. Paul begins, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness or religiosity, although they have denied its power. And avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins. They also have, they're led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Does any of that ring true for you as you look at our society today? It's interesting how a scripture verse written 2,000 years ago can be so accurate to describe what is taking place in our life today. It's right on the mark. So Noah was a righteous man, blameless, who walked with God. Consider his message, and that's why I'm calling this message, is if anybody listening, 125 years, 125 years where nobody listened. Hence the title of my message. Now, let's take a look at a few things here. Number one, he spent 125 years building a huge boat. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? What do you need a boat for? There's never been a flood before. Matter of fact, some would postulate there's never been in rain before. Yes, there were oceans, but there wasn't rain. It seemed as though water or dew came up from the ground to water everything. And here, Noah is building a boat. Where did he get the money to build a boat? Where did he get the help? Where did he get the supplies? We know God gave him the schematics, but how did he pull it all together for 125 years? That's just amazing. I'm looking for my glasses here, but I don't know where I put them. Yeah, I must have left them in the back there. Oh, well, because I have some comments to, to uh, put with these uh, guys. Is my glasses back there? Did I leave them back there? Uh, they would have been right next to you, Reuben. I was just sitting right there. Ah, they're over here. How'd they get over here? You know what? These are Shane's. Hey, Shane, do you mind if I use your glasses? Uh, yeah, I do. I can't even see through them. <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, I'm going to go by memory here. So you've got 125 years building a boat. 125 years enduring insults, being made fun of, and being ridiculed, ridiculed and a lot more. 125 years with putting up with people's baloney. I watched the movie Evan Almighty. I don't know if you've read that with uh, uh, Steve Carroll. And God calls him to build an ark. And uh, if you watch the movie, it's quite cute. Uh, but you see how he uh, went through a lot of insults in that movie. Poor guy. He went through a lot, but God showed up at the last minute and a flood comes down, the ark gets moving and away we go. But can you imagine 25, 125 years building the boat, 125 years of putting up with insults, 125 years of building a boat to float in a flood deluge that nobody had ever seen before. Ever seen a flood before? Have you ever seen a flood before? Do you know what a flood is? Do you know what a flood is? No, you're supposed to go like this because nobody has ever seen a flood before back in Noah's day. And I can just imagine there's probably some smart aleck little kid going, I've never seen a, a flood before, a deluge. I've never seen a boat before, but I've seen a root beer float. You never know. They're the wise guys, you know. 125 years of pe preaching repentance and faith in God and judgment to come, and nobody listens. How do you like them apples? Talk about a fruitless life or what would seem to be a fruitless life. It's rather interesting. 125 years building a boat that it was ha uh, almost the size of the Titanic, which is amazing. Uh, what else to say about that? 
But during those 125 years, Noah pressed on. He carried out these burdens because he walked by faith. God said, build this doggone boat. It's going to come in handy pretty soon. He was married. He had three sons, three daughters-in-law. To think that that was a harmonious family probably would have been a stretch. No family's perfect. I think Noah probably uh, got a drinking problem holding up with all this stuff. I really, I really do. Because what's the first thing he does when the ark, when he gets out of the ark? He plants a vineyard, and then he gets drunk. Where did that learned behavior come from? I have a feeling he enjoyed imbibing before the flood. No, Noah was not a perfect guy. You know, the Bible says this about Noah in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, which is a really important word there, by faith, because everybody has ever been used by God and has stood before God, been used by God, and been forgiven by God is by faith. By faith, being warned by God of things not yet seen in reverence. Noah prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. There's that word again, righteousness according to faith. The Bible says the righteous shall live by faith. Noah, in the midst of an absolutely corrupt society, was a man of faith. He walked with God. And even though nobody listened for 125 years, all that time he was condemning the world. They just didn't know it. No one had ever seen the flood before until the floods came and people were trying to rush the, rush the ark. And by that time, it's too late. It's too late. And so for us, as we look at this preacher's life, Noah, a man just like, like you and I, preaching for 125 years, get right with God, judgment's coming, no one listened. Did it matter in the end? No. Again, nobody listened. However, it did matter that God, through Noah, was giving tons of grace through 125 years. Every day that people walked by the ark was a moment of grace. Something's going to happen. Wake up. Just like today, people are sleeping in the light. I'm gratified that the church is are seeing an explosion of interest in Christianity as we've been going through this time of isolation and all the fears of the coronavirus. But there are 7 billion people on this planet. There's a lot of people that have yet to be reached for Jesus Christ. People had a chance to get right with God and be forgiven. But the people of Noah's day refused and chose not to accept God's offer of forgiveness and for that personal decision that they made, they perished. Noah was faithful to the task. And he saw no fruit for his labors, but that wasn't his responsibility. It was the people who heard him. It was their responsibility. It fell upon them. In the meantime, God saved Noah, his three sons and his wife and daughters, and much of the animal kingdom to start all over again. So when the floods came, the Bible says that God brought in the animals. God shut that gigantic door to the ark. And God was saying at that moment, mission's accomplished, Noah. Let's start all over again. The rains fell for 40 days. And the, rain, and the water was on the earth for 150 days, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. So that every living thing that had breath would in those 150 days perish. Rather interesting. It's also interesting when Noah was trying to figure out if the water was still on the land, he sent out two birds. One was a raven, and one was a dove. What's the difference? He sent out the raven, the, uh, the first one, and the raven never came back. Why is that? Because ravens are predatory animals. They eat dead flesh. That little raven that was sent out was having a feast. Because you've got to remember, 125 days, there's bodies and animals and all sorts of stuff floating all over the world. And the raven, uh, the raven was having uh, a feast. The dove was a different kind of bird. That's another story for another 
message. But it's interesting that the raven was sent out first. You see, Noah, even though he had no one listening to him, he walked by faith and he do, did what God told him to do. And that is, in, in the bottom line, in the final analysis, the only one who we need to receive the acceptance from. Noah received his acceptance. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And it's our desire as well that as we are received by God, he looks into our life and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You walked by faith, you were blameless, but nobody's blameless. We're blameless in Jesus Christ. We're righteous, but we're righteous in Jesus Christ. And we walk with God because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to walk in such a way. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Everyone approaches God and walks with God by faith. And then God, in response to our faith, blesses our socks off. Everyone that's ever been used by God for eternal purposes or reaching people for Christ has always been based upon faith putting our trust and faith in God and because we don't see what he sees just like Noah had no idea he couldn't see 125 years into the future what would happen but by faith he obeyed God so what about you and I what are some takeaways uh, from uh, Noah's life that we can apply to our lives number one I'm going to go through quickly because time is escaping me be a person who is righteous, blameless, and walks with God. Our walk with God is by faith, and all of us approach God by faith, and God moves in response to yours and my faith. Number two, be the salt and light that you were called to be. Noah in his day was called to be salt and light, and people, even though they didn't listen to him, they still saw because the building of the ark was judgment against them. You and I have no idea who's watching our lives. Noah's salt and light for 125 years. We get maybe 70, 80, or 90 years. But you know what? People are watching us. People are watching us. For many people, the closest some people will ever get to seeing God or experience heaven itself is through yours and my life. We need to understand that. We need to be the salt and light that God has called us to. Number three, expect pushback. Noah got pushed back for 125 years. Insults day in and day out. Jesus experienced insults and pushback. And Jesus told us, hey, if the master is going to get pushed back, you as my disciples will get pushed back too. Who cares? If Noah can do it for 125 years, Jesus can go to the cross and die on a cross in pushback, we can handle a little pushback. Because the, is the issue is this. At the end of the day, are you satisfied that your friends and family and co-workers are going to hell tonight if they don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? That is a true statement. This coronavirus and this separation that we've had should be a wake-up call to us. This world is corrupt. This world is ending soon. People are going to hell. People are going to heaven. Our job is to be the salt and light and witness wherever we can and trust God for the, for the fruit bearing, for the results to take place. Are you okay with that? I'm not. We're here to change people's lives, to be salt and light. We've got one go around. Why not use that one life and one go around to be an instrument in God's hands that change people's lives for eternity? Because when someone dies, their eternal destiny is done at that point. They wake up in one of two places, heaven or hell. Our job is to try to get people and to persuade people and pray for people that they would turn to God so that their eternal destiny and their eternal address is changed. Expect pushback. Who cares? We love people enough to tell them the truth. Trust God with what he's called you to do. God knows exactly how to where to use you in the body of Christ or in the kingdom in this world. Trust God to work through you. Do what he's called you to do. Noah built a boat and nobody's worried. That's a boat, for crying out loud. In today's world, you never know where God will place you and call you. 
But in that calling, be secure that God will give you the strength and the power to walk in that calling. Fruit bearing, trust God to work through you. And fruit bearing is not for you anyway. It's for other people to be blessed by what God is doing in and through your life so that their lives are changed. And then finally, be steadfast, immovable. Your toil is not in the vein of the Lord. Whatever is done in Jesus' name is not in vain at all. And so as Noah persevered for 125 years, and he lived to a ripe old age of 950 years, by the way, be steadfast, immovable, trust God. Examples from the Bible are for us to glean and to learn. Noah, in the midst of an absolutely corrupt society, still found a way to walk with God, to be blameless, and to be a righteous man. And so can we, as we looked at a verse of scripture earlier about the conditions of society when Jesus comes. Now let me ask you a question. We've run out of time here, so I'm going to close with this thought. You may be watching this program tonight. 5,000 people a week are watching this program. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? Have you considered the claims of Jesus Christ with an open mind? Many atheists have written books where they had come to study out this person, Jesus Christ, and they ended up believing that this man who said he was God in the flesh was exactly who he said he was. And they gave their lives to Christ and then gone on to write a whole lot of books about reasons why Jesus is who he said he is. He is the Messiah. He is the King. He is the Lord. Have you given any thought to Jesus Christ to be your Savior and your Lord tonight? And maybe you're hearing this for the first time. God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. He isn't in this far out distant place. He's here. He's everywhere present. It's called the the, the, the omnipresence of God. He's everywhere. And he's just waiting. Heaven goes crazy when one person gives their life to Jesus Christ. Maybe tonight is your night where you change your eternal destiny from hell to heaven. And it happens like that in response to a prayer. Can I pray with you tonight? Would you pray with me this prayer? And God will hear. God knows the content and the intents of your heart. And it's not that the prayer changes your life, but it's the content of wanting change that God listens to. So pray with me this prayer, if you would. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life, tonight's your night. Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I would ask and pray that you would please save me. Please forgive me. Please wash me from all of my sins. Come into my heart to be my Savior and Lord. I want to be born again. I want my spirit to come alive to you. I want to hear you. I want to be able to read your Bible and have it make sense in my life. I want to go to heaven. Your word says that all who call upon your name will be saved, and I'm calling on your name tonight. Jesus, save me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I would like to hear from you tonight. On the screen here is our prayer uh, uh, website or email address. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, feel free to email me. That goes straight to me and nobody else. Prayer at ocsfc1.org. If you'd like a phone call from me, just give me your name and your phone number, and I will call you back. If you don't want a phone call, but you just want to let somebody know that you prayed that prayer, write us back at that address as well. And for those of you who are part of the family of God, uh, we're opening up next Friday night. We'll see you here more on that in just a couple of moments. But if you have things that are going on in your life that you would want to have prayer for, 40 million Americans are out of work right now. Maybe you may be one of them. We want to pray for you. We have a whole team of people that will pray for you, and they're just waiting for an email from me so they'll pray for you. Maybe it's healing for something going on in your life. A prayer, uh, a, a 
Maybe you have the coronavirus. I don't know anybody that's got it. I don't know anybody who knows anybody that's got it, but there's got to be somebody that has it because it's affecting a lot of people. But maybe you're out there and, and uh, you need prayer in that regard. We want to hear from you. Whatever your prayer request is, we want to hear from you. And in the confidence, you don't even have to write your name, send that prayer request to that address and we'll be praying for you. But that said, uh, Jessica is going to bring us through another song and then I'll be back up with some closing comments in just a few moments. Jessica. Let's continue to worship tonight as we respond to these challenging words. Lord, we place our trust in you, the one who saves. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy. Oh, 
don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Do you guys believe that tonight? He is moving. He is working. He is for you. see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working But thank you for joining us here on our Facebook Live. And uh, just a few uh, closing thoughts as we uh, wrap up the evening. Uh, number one, thank you for those of you who have been putting your prayer requests online. I'm reading them here. Uh, Tim Sanchez, got your prayer request. Uh, Marie from Scottsdale, uh, Arizona, I got your card. Thank you very much. All good. God bless you. You're a wonderful card. Uh, thank you for that beautiful card that you sent. And uh, for the rest of you as well that are... Uh, putting a request down. I will see them later on when I get home and I will send them off to our prayer team. A few things before we leave. Remember, next Friday night we're live again. Please look to our website uh, at ocsinglesforchrist.org. Sign up for the newsletter. Next Wednesday I'll be sending out information of what Friday, next Friday night will look like on the screen right behind me. Uh, remember that uh, we have our hiking tomorrow night. Those of you who want to Join us up at Newport Coast, at Coastal Peak Park. Uh, Jack Miller will be leading that, and I think there's around 40 people now that are signed up. So show up. There are a lot of people on the trails, so show up before 9 so you get a parking spot, and Jack will meet you at the trailhead, which is in the cul-de-sac as you walk out onto the, uh, onto the trails. Now, a little birdie told me here that... Uh, it's Jessica's birthday today. 29 years old. Amazing. Uh, 29 and holding. That's Jessica right there. Not me. That's her. Right. Uh, I'm trying to see the. There she is. Right there. She's waving behind me. This is Jessica. So all of you guys give a hand clap on the. Uh, <laughs> I can see you online. Thanks, on you guys. On the Facebook Live, you're welcome to do the hand clap, and she will see the hand claps later on. And Mom Jessica over there in, uh, no, Joyce. Mom Joyce in Minnesota. Uh, you raised a fine young lady. So Aww. thank you for sharing her life with us. So happy birthday, Jessica. Thank and you. You're welcome. quite welcome. And then also we do want to give a shout out to our veterans today. Uh, this is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, so we just want to give it up for those. My father died uh, in the military. When I was four years of age, millions of people have given their lives for this country. And we're grateful. And we do remember them this weekend and Memorial Day weekend. To remember the sacrifices that were paid in order for us to have freedom. The sad thing is, is we're throwing our freedom away today because of fear. And I have been one of the vocal pastors 
that have been saying it's time to set aside fear and it's time to walk in the liberties that have been granted to us, not only by God, but also secured by so many people who paid the ultimate price, like my dad, so that I might have freedom tonight. So for those of you who have been in the military, you veterans, God bless you. Thank you for your service. And uh, enjoy the weekend. I think as a veteran, you have your military card, and it's free food all weekend, I think. (laughs) Something like that. So enjoy the weekend, and God bless you. All right, with that said, we're just going to close it out with some uh, running trails on the TV screen. And Jessica is going to end the evening with some uh, what we call vamping. God bless you guys. See you next week. Take care.